Well, the symposium topic is uh, human migration across the globe, and the important uh, last part of that title is to the ends of the earth. Um, so in the next uh, few moments, I'm going to talk about the ends of the earth, and following up on what uh, Gregor Larson told us this morning, this will be migration, lots of sex, at the end of the earth. So I will take you there now. <clears throat> well, uh, the Pacific is about one-third of the Earth's surface. Uh, it's a vast area. It's a vast, empty area. And the region I'm going to talk about in the eastern Pacific, that's really in this uh, view from Google Earth, there are more than 500 islands over a region larger than all of North America. About 289,000 square kilometers of land over more than 20 million square kilometers of ocean. Think about what that looks like. We're, we're land-loving species, and we forget what vast areas of open ocean are like. So we should ap appreciate uh, the region that we are talking about. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up for a minute and also say that um, I'm not talking about the southwestern Pacific, and our coverage is going to get a little bit of a, a gap here. So to fill that gap, I'm going to tell you very, very quickly that the region from island Southeast Asia uh, into an area called remote Oceania, islands that are no longer intervisible, where you have to sail outside of the site of land to colonize those islands. That colonization in the southwest Pacific of islands like Vanuatu, New Caledonia, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, uh, happened between about 3,200 years ago to 2,800 years ago. So um, that's kind of the first chapter that I'm skipping over. That means that uh, Polynesians got to the region of Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa, and I'm going to talk about the region east of Samoa across the emptiest part of the Pacific and talk to you <clears throat> about colonization of islands like Tahiti that you can see here in this view from Moorea, uh, and this view on Moorea of Cook's Bay. These are really famous, uh, idyllic, uh, classic islands of the South Pacific. Uh, we're also going to be talking about colonization of the Marquesas Islands, you see here in this slide, all the way down to New Zealand, um, below the tropics, all the way up to Hawaii, this view of the Napali coast of Kauai, and this view of the east end of Maui near Hana, um, so all the way to Hawaii, down to the Austral Islands, this is the island of Rapa'iti, and all the way out to one of my favorites, Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, at the, the very end of the world. Um, in fact, the name for Rapa Nui, the traditional name, is Tepito Tehenua, which means the end of the earth. Um, great name and fitting with our symposium. I'm also going to be talking about, uh, I'll just briefly introduce it now because it's part of this spectacular story that uh, I'm going to try to cover for you briefly. And that is that Polynesians certainly reached South America. The evidence is in these humble uh, crops, the, the sweet potato or kumara, as we call them in Polynesia. Um, these are not plants that floated or were carried by birds or rafted because um, not only are they South American cultigens, but their name is South American, as we see from coastal and uh, mountain areas of Ecuador, where the um, name for, the, for kumar or kumara uh, is also found. So the fact that the crop is transported with the name suggests that people are getting it, and the Pacific view on this is that Pacific Islanders go to the uh, coast of South America and bring it back. But I'll be talking about the context in which that happened because um, a lot else happened at the same time. <clears throat> well, you, you heard from uh, Tom Hyam yesterday talking about radiocarbon dating, and radiocarbon dating has really revolutionized archaeology. And in the Pacific, it meant that since the 1950s, uh, archaeologists could focus on migrations and movements between the islands in the Pacific. This slide is a, a, a 1958 photograph from uh, Nualolo Kai, a rock shelter on the Napali coast of Kauai. And it was at this time that Kenneth Emery, uh, Yoshi Sinoto, uh, Bill Bonk and others, Roger Green was there. Many of the, the early pioneers in Pacific archaeology were asking the question about Hawaiian origins, and embedded in that question of Hawaiian origins was also what were the movements of people within the Pacific. 
Now, I've mentioned that West Polynesia, which you see here, now we have a map with names, and the Pacific looks much smaller, and the islands look closer with names. That's why I like the Google image version. But West Polynesia settled by about 2,800 years ago by people making pottery, and they are the descendants of uh, seafaring people from the uh, islands of Southeast Asia and into the Western Pacific. East Polynesia, the region uh, east of Samoa, and all the way north to Hawaii, south to New Zealand, and all the way to the remote Eastern Pacific and Easter Island, uh, is an area that was recognized on linguistic grounds and on cultural grounds. There are some cultural differences in East Polynesia. And it really forms a big triangle with those, uh, those uh, islands at the, along the outliers, Hawaii, New Zealand, and Easter. Well, research, as I mentioned, that went along with the work in Hawaii. Also, uh, there was work in the Marquesas Islands. Robert Suggs from the American Museum uh, worked at a place called Ha'atuatua. And one of the early radiocarbon dates, both early in terms of getting radiocarbon dates and a date that was also old, was 150 BC from excavations in this sand dune. And the first radiocarbon dates from the Pacific really startled researchers because the view before radiocarbon dating was that the settlement of the Pacific was recent, the time death was shallow, and that everything we knew could be deciphered from oral traditions and from counting generations and kind of building chronology in that way. I'm going to return to that a little bit near the end of my presentation. Well, in the uh, 1980s and 1990s, uh, work continued, and for example, uh, Patrick Kirch uh, worked on Mangaya in the southern Cook Islands, and with lake core sediments, uh, sed sediments uh, they radiocarbon dated uh, changes in vegetation, what they thought were changes in vegetation, dating to as early as 500 BC. So Marquesas 150 BC, Cook Islands 500 BC, you can see the picture that was developing is that not only were the Pacific Islands settled much earlier than anyone thought, but now it looks like there was a long chronology for the remote islands of the Eastern Pacific. This is Rano Kao on Rapa Nui, and pollen studies there done beginning in the 1970s and continuing up until recent times with uh, proposed dates of settlement for Rapa Nui as early as 200 AD, 400 AD, 800 AD, 1000 AD, there are many different arguments, and I'll be hopefully clarifying for that for you as well. So the picture emerging, as I said, long settlement and imagining that people are leaving Samoa and slowly but surely colonizing islands over this long period of time, moving from place to place and so on. Now, over the years, this view was also uh, really augmented by looking at the languages of the Pacific. And you see a linguistic subgrouping here for Polynesian languages. And you can see in this diagram over on the right-hand side, Proto-Eastern Polynesian. And we heard about languages this morning. This is a reconstruction of the family tree for those languages with the idea that there is a, a central Eastern Polynesian group that includes the uh, uh, languages in the Marquesas plus Hawaii and Mangarevan, and that there is a Tahitic group that includes New Zealand Maori, the Paumotu languages of the Tuamotus, the Cook Islands, Tahitian, and Easter Island, you can see, is out there on its own. Now, the, uh, the linguists and the early biological anthropologists and people looking at plants and animals and archaeologists were working on the question of migrations and origins and chronology. And I think kind of the old school, at least I'm, I'm going to say that now, is that <clears throat> to do this, you kind of wanted to know what the story was and how your evidence contributed to that story. Now, in philosophy of science, we might call that, you know, sort of drifting into circular arguments, and that's what was happening, is that everyone was kind of trying to reinforce the other lines of evidence rather than look at their own evidence independently. Evidence of this, you can see in this diagram, uh, putting an absolute time scale from radiocarbon dating onto linguistic uh, subgrouping and then proposing kind of a, a migration in time and space that would produce the daughter languages from those ancestral populations across the Pacific. Um, and I'm not going to leave that up there too long because I don't want that to, you know, corrupt anyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you why that's probably all wrong. 
Uh, this version has evolved over time, and what, what, what we see are different versions of Samoa being settled, then movement into East Polynesia. And you can see in this diagram, we've got it numbered one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And what this is showing is kind of a sequence of stepping stone islands with a long chronology and people staying in places for a long time before moving on to other places. You can also see kind of a peculiar order. Uh, the, uh, Easter Island, for example, 400 AD, is settled before the Society Islands and long before New Zealand. So uh, there was a belief that there was kind of a, a, a very unusual and kind of step-like and you know who knows where people were going to end up when. And it all seemed pretty reasonable. It evolved, and, and by the 2000s, uh, this was a version uh, with the dates for um, settlement across the region. They tended to get uh, later, but not always. And here's yet another recently published version um, with the chronology. Now, what I hope you've noticed in looking at the chronology here is that um, there's, there are quite variable uh, dates here. And a few years ago, working with uh, my colleague in New Zealand, Janet Wilmshurst, who's also worked a lot with Tom Hyam, who you've heard from yesterday, um, we began to question the chronology, and we had both uh, done work in different places looking at chronology. Uh, I had done some work in Rapa Nui looking at uh, the question of chronology, and she had done so with Tom Hyam in New Zealand looking at questions there. Well, what I want to introduce you is what, what happened next and, and how the story uh, changes pretty dramatically. The first thing is that... Um, <clears throat> Radiocarbon dating is a great method, but we have to be careful in using it, and I'm going to, I, I think, I, I've already started to demonstrate that radiocarbon dating has probably been uh, misused in, in the Pacific, at least, and certainly there are examples elsewhere. But what we have to be concerned with in not misusing radiocarbon dating is that radiocarbon dating works. It dates the death of an organism, as uh, Tom mentioned yesterday, and the problem is that archaeologists are not always interested in when something died. They might be interested in something related to what they, well, it might be a long road between the two. Let me give you an example. And we talk about a radiocarbon event, what radiocarbon dating is actually dating, and the target event, what we're trying to date. The target event that we're going to infer from radiocarbon uh, would be <clears throat> something like, when did people arrive on a particular island? Now. There, is, uh, there can be a, pr a problem because if the radiocarbon event and the target event become sort of far apart for some reason, um, then we're not dating what we think we're dating. Okay, beautiful Hawaiian beach covered in driftwood, and it turns out that driftwood in Hawaii comes from the Pacific Northwest Coast and from North, uh, Northern Asia, and the wood goes adrift and makes, their way, uh, makes its way to Pacific Islands, and in the 1960s, when, when people were kind of wondering about what's called the inbuilt age problem or old wood problem, uh, Kenneth Emery and Yoshi Sinoto, who were part of this Hawaiian migration uh, project, were looking at dates from the southern part of Hawaii Island. And they were having trouble getting consistent dates. And what they did is they took a walk along the beach and they collected some driftwood and they sent it to radiocarbon labs. And guess what they found? Um, there was some Douglas fir driftwood that was 500 years old. There was some re western red cedar collected the same day that dated to an impressive 1,200 years old. They were demonstrating the old wood problem, and uh, ancient islanders would have no problem picking up driftwood to use as fuel, and then archaeologists are going to get very excited when the dates are very old, but very wrong. Well, there was another uh, interesting story in New Zealand that was kind of occurring at the same time that we were working on issues in uh, Rapa Nui. This is re recent, uh, in recent years. Um, and I won't go into detail, but there was a lot of excitement about some rat bone dates from New Zealand that looked very, very old, as much as 2,000 years old. And rats are introduced by humans. They're not in New Zealand naturally. And so the Pacific rat that came with Polynesians, if it was 2,000 years old, then people brought it there 2,000 years ago. That was kind of the simple argument. Well, uh, there were lots of problems that uh, really are not, not the focus of, of my talk today, but uh, Janet Wilmshurst and Tom Hyam began to solve this problem by saying, let's look at uh, not just dating rat bones, trying to redate rat bones and, and, and see if we really get dates that old, 
But let, let's state something that uh, we're a little more confident about in terms of the kinds of uh, pretreatments, et cetera. And let's look at rat gnawed seeds, native seeds that were chewed in a characteristic way by rats and date them. And what they found was that if you dated rat gnawed seeds, everything fell after about 1200 AD. And there were many cases of this and really uh, the chronology was resolved. So you can see intact seeds on the top of that slide there and rat gnawed seeds uh, on the lower half. And what looked like a long chronology in New Zealand was then a much shorter chronology and it also showed that people colonized the large islands of New Zealand very quickly from north to south and spread uh, throughout many parts of those very large islands. Um, and the problem appeared to be resolved. In fact, it was resolved, I think, in that project. Well, this gets us to then what developed among Pacific archaeologists as kind of two models, uh, long chronology, those who believed in long chronologies, and those who argued for short chronologies. And as we sort of broke this down, and this is a, this is a, a table that I've borrowed from uh, Ethel Anderson from the Australian National University, and here we sort of look at things like subsistence. What are people eating? What are they doing? In the long chronology, you imagine that <clears throat> getting your food with agriculture or with hunting and gathering, uh, fishing, etc., that in a long chronology, that's cryptic for a long time. People get there, and everything they're doing stays rather hidden. In the short chronology, we imagine that people colonize islands, and they take advantage of naive uh, um, prey, and they plant crops, etc., and that in a short chronology, that subsistence is optimal. It's not hidden. It's sort of out there, and people are doing what they need to do. You're probably going to see very quickly which side I'm on. Um, population growth in the long chronology is very, very slow. Um, you arrive on a new island with you and two other families, and everyone decides that we should only have 1.5 children because who knows what might happen, right? So low population growth. Um, and in the short chronology, fast population growth. You're there with a small number of people, and there are limitless, apparently limitless opportunities, and so populations would grow fast. The ecological impacts with the long chronology, negligible or very delayed, and in short chronology, significant and rapid. That makes visibility of arriving, arriving on the island very low if you believe in a long chronology because it has to stay invisible. On, uh, in the short chronology, colonization visibility is high. When you get there, you become visible to future archaeologists pretty fast. And the argument about radiocarbon dating is that there will always, it'll always be hard to find things. You won't have very many dates that represent when people really got there, so you always add a bit of you know, uncertainty by adding time to the story. In the short chronology, you basically say radiocarbon dating is pretty good at estimating when people arrive if you're using uh, reliable dates and uh, the radiocarbon event and the target event are close to one another. What these look like kind of in graphic form, you can imagine there, uh, the long chronology is you arrive, you, you, you go through time, and your visibility, as you see this in the archaeological evidence there, um, is low, and then at some point things begin to change as population grows and you become more visible. An intermediate chronology would look like that, except less time being invisible. And then a short chronology model looks like this, where uh, you arrive, you're pretty quickly visible because things happen pretty quickly, um, and so that our ability to see and understand what happens when people arrive is actually pretty good. Well, um, I would argue that short chronologies, uh, the, the assumptions there are a better fit with the actual evidence and with what we understand about Pacific Island colonization. First off, Polynesians are uh, colonizing the Pacific fully prepared with a whole roster of plants and animals that they're carrying with them. And if you arrive on uh, a new island um, and you have plants and animals on board, you need to put them in the ground, you need to get animals reproducing, etc. And so you're not going to simply abandon those things and become hunter-gatherers for a while and then later have a Neolithic revolution and things change. So you really are taking what we've called in, uh, in the Pacific a transported landscape between islands and reestablishing the kind of subsistence you know. Polynesians also carried with them very successfully the Pacific rat. And I mentioned that for New Zealand. Carrying the rat with you uh, creates quite a bit of visibility because rats reproduce rapidly. Um, getting back to migration and sex, and here we are, rats reproduce very well. A mating pair of rats can uh, reproduce themselves into about three million rats in less than three years. 
Um, that will create some visibility. It might even create a pretty good Hollywood, Hollywood version of, you know, rat invasion of the Pacific. Um, but with uh, no predators on most islands and rapid reproduction rates, uh, they will become visible. And they're visible in terms of rat bones uh, and uh, rat predation of native seeds. And here you see, for example, on Rapa Nui, uh, palm nuts with rat gnawing, with characteristic rat gnawing to eat the nut inside, uh, and they would have a pretty immediate impact and, importantly, uh, visibility. Well, with that in mind, I want to take a look at East Polynesian chronologies, and to do so, I want to propose something uh, that we did in a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, where we looked at more than 1,400 dates, and we classified them as class one, two, and three. The important thing that we did is that class one dates are on identified short-lived material. In other words, the radiocarbon event and the target event are going to be close together, and we don't have to worry about inbuilt age with something like driftwood. If you identified a charcoal sample that was radiocarbon dated and it was western red cedar and it was in Hawaii, you might be concerned about what that age is. And you realize that those big trees are, um, they're old on the inside and young on the outside. So as the rings grow, you could actually get an old radiocarbon date from a living tree uh, by dating the center rings. Class two, uh, long-lived plant material that are identified, but also unidentified wood charcoal, um, so it could be anything. Um, class, th we sort of call this the, the good, the bad, and the ugly because it gets really bad because you have unidentified uh, material with very large error terms. So if you're trying to estimate when people arrived and your radiocarbon date is plus or minus 300 years, it doesn't give you much precision, so don't try to analyze it and end up guessing that the early end of the 300 years is the one you like, so you accept it. We, we took that out as well. So high precision, uh, good material that represents short-lived materials. And with over 1,400 dates uh, for the first analysis, and I should say now we're over 3,000 dates with a couple of other publications, and the same pattern is holding. And what you see here is the class one dates, the dark blue for all of the uh, archipelagos of East Polynesia. It shows that the way you get a long chronology is with kind of crappy dates. Um, class two dates with unknown material and larger errors, class three dates with unknown material and large errors um, produce long chronologies. If you look at the Marquesas there on the bottom, um, the chronology with class two and three dates is very long, perhaps back to almost 500 BC, but on really reliable materials it's much shorter, much later. Um, and so we decided that in our analysis what we would do is filter the dates by reliability, that is, look at what the class one dates were telling us, even though there were not as many of them. And what we found is that when you took separate archipelagos, here's New Zealand, for example, uh, very well dated with the, the projects that had taken place there, uh, class one dates there, the green line, uh, form a later chronology, and as you add uncertainty and error, you get the uh, uh, red and orange lines, and the chronology gets longer and longer and longer. So we don't really want our chronologies to be based on something that we don't know or that could be very much in error, and so we want to really stick with the, what the green line is telling us. Well, an interesting thing emerged as we began working on this because um, we looked at uh, all the archipelagos in East Polynesia. We collated all the dates that we could for the initial analysis, and we began to see a pattern emerge. And here is Hawaii, for example. You see the same thing. The green line there is later. The red and orange really add much more time. Well, the pattern I'm talking about is when we looked at the archipelagos of East Polynesia, we saw something very surprising. What we found is that uh, the society islands were in the um, western part of eastern Polynesia were earlier, they were coming in just after 1000 AD, about uh, 1050 to 1100 AD, maybe you know, right in that neighborhood for the beginning. And the other islands were all coming in after 1200 AD. And we found a very consistent pattern from one archipelago to the next. And this actually surprised us and we thought about a lot of ways that this could, something could be tricking us. And we, we saw that because the results were so consistent, we believe that and they were consistent between large islands like New Zealand and small islands like Rapa Nui or, or um, other very small islands, um, that we were actually seeing a pattern that reflected the movement of people into the region. 
Um, so on this, uh, on this chart here, you see these are uh, probability distributions, both aggregate and cumulative, when you look at the radiocarbon date probabilities of class one dates. And you can see there, I realize it's a small slide, but what you see there on the left-hand side for each island is that um, things take off around 1200 AD. And in the center of that chart is the Society Islands or Tahiti uh, a little bit earlier at about uh, 1000, 1050. Um, and a very consistent pattern. So societies, perhaps Gambier, I'll talk about that briefly. Gambier is in the Austral Islands down in the south. And then the other East Polynesian islands there, the blue line. What this would look like spatially is that um, you have uh, settlement of Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa uh, around 2,800 years ago. That's pretty well established. And then at around 1,000 to 1,050, uh, people leave that region, probably Samoa. I could talk more about that, but for, for sake of being brief, I'll just say Samoa and moved into eastern Polynesia where the Society Islands were on present evidence the first place colonized. Within about 150, 200 years, people left the Society Islands and then colonized the rest of the remote Pacific with really contemporaneous dates for Hawaii, Rapa Nui, Marquesas, Tuamotus, Cook Islands, New Zealand, and even all the way down to the Auckland Islands, um, some rather uh, blustery, inhospitable islands way south of New Zealand where there is archaeological evidence and radiocarbon dates that fit in the same chronology. Well, the, the implication here, uh, there are many implications here, and one is that uh, leaving society islands and colonizing the rest of the Pacific within just a few human generations and within what looks like about a century, um, this was very rapid uh, phase of high mobility, good seafaring, uh, discovery of these islands. And this is the same episode that I mentioned at the beginning when people reached South America and brought the sweet potato back. So that's part of that very high mobility across the region. Um, <clears throat> so what, what, what are some of the implications here? I've said that after about 1050 AD, we see the earliest evidence of East Polynesian colonization in the Society Islands and perhaps beyond. Let me address the beyond part. You saw that orange circle going out to uh, the Gambier Islands, to Mangareva Island in particular. There is one class, date, one, one class one date there that is about 100 years earlier, and we're not quite sure what that means. I'm a little concerned that it's only one date. It is a class one date, but we'd like to see more dates there. There are now, since our study has been published, uh, a, a handful, and literally you could probably count on one hand, a few other dates that are about 100 years or so earlier. We're not sure if that's telling us that there's a little more complexity in what's going on or there are still problems with single dates on things that are not clearly associated with uh, that movement of people. And that, that's sort of going to remain up in the air. We can talk about that with questions if you like. Then by about 12 to 1290 AD, we see rapid, near simultaneous settlement of all the remaining island groups of East Polynesia. And that is the same episode when people reach South America, bring back the sweet potato. On present evidence, this becomes important, it's not possible to discern a settlement order after the society. So um, what some of us learned in school in Hawaii, for example, that uh, Hawaii was first colonized from the Marquesas and then later settled from Tahiti, it's all gone. And I can, I can talk about the basis for that, but that was based on um, other evidence that turns out also not to be the case when we look a, more, a little more critically. Some of the other implications, um, why were people in Samoa so long and then uh, went to Tahiti and stayed a fairly short time and then colonized just everything else? It seems like something really erased distance, something that was technological, something with a voyaging innovation. Uh, there's some linguistic hint that it could be double-hulled canoes, but it's very, you know, it's very iffy kind of thing. Um, but something did really erase distance because every scrap of land was settled within a fairly short amount of time, people reaching all the way north to Hawaii, south to New Zealand, Rapa Nui, and to South America. Um, some have speculated that the higher frequencies of El Nino Southern Oscillation um, could have sort of allowed people to sail with westerly winds and move from west to east more easily. Um, there are increases in El Nino events before this happens, but the centuries in which this happens before and after, you know, during this interval are actually, they're very frequent events during these centuries. Uh, we know from the 
uh, El Nino record, so this could have an effect. And people writing about Pacific Island navigation have written about El Nino and it's uh, what it would do for Pacific colonization. Um, of course, this colonization would have required very high population growth rates on the order of probably three or four percent growth per year. Um, so yes, migration and all the sex that Gregory was talking about would have been, I mean, there would have been sex on the beach. Um, and we're not talking about cocktails, we're talking about big families um, and colonizing the, these remote islands. The environmental impacts would have occurred very quickly. And what people thought were centuries for certain birds to go extinct, for vegetation to change, et cetera, uh, probably occurring over decades, not centuries. And um, I've written about the influence of the rat on deforestation in Rapa Nui, drawing on work done in Hawaii, and interesting that the effects there could be so fast with the invasion of, um, with rats. This uh, would have been a period of great mobility, and some of the things that we hear about inter-island migration between the islands uh, might also be the same period of discovery, colonization, interaction. And so I like to sort of think about it, about it as mobility rather than a migration per se. There's a lot of similarity in language, human biology, and culture uh, in East Polynesia, and it seems to make sense that it was not only settled late, but there was some period of interaction that accounts for that similarity. So the picture we have is that people reach the, the, really, uh, um, the really beautiful islands of the society group uh, where there were abundant resources. This is a view of Moorea, and from there uh, colonized much of the Pacific rather rapidly. What was interesting is as we did this study, I looked back on a book that I had read many years ago by Sir Peter Buck, or Te Rangi Hiroa, a Maori anthropologist who in the 1930s wrote Vikings of the Sunrise. And this is a figure from that book, and he talks about around the uh, 12th or 13th century, people left Hawaiki, the original name for the island of Raiatea in the society group, and settled much of the Pacific. And, um, as we worked on this project, we sort of lamented that perhaps millions of dollars had been wasted on radiocarbon dating because Peter Buck knew it back in the 1930s. Uh, <laughs> and this was based on oral tradition. So it's kind of interesting how it has converged on that. So great maritime technology and seafaring skills would lead Polynesians to, to discover uh, the most remote parts, uh, the ends of the earth as suggested in the symposium. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like to take a moment, and I, I, I guess I also want to entice you to invite me back to talk about Rapa Nui, because it doesn't really fit the symposium, uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about something about Rapa Nui, because it is the end of the earth, and it is part of this story, and reaching Rapa Nui is, is a, a pretty amazing feat in and of itself, and then what happened there is even more amazing, because on this tiny remote island, people carved about a thousand statues and moved them to every corner of the island, and it has become a really uh, famous story of um, sort of human tragedy or perhaps human conquest. I don't know how you want to think about it. I think about it as the latter. Well, one of the questions that has really plagued uh, everyone and, and, uh, is, is if you carve a thousand statues, how did you get them to every corner of the island? And people have been uh, asking this question for a long time. And the islanders will simply tell you, and it's the title of our book, the statues walked. And they just kept saying this, and researchers and visitors kept laughing and being patronizing and saying, oh, that's a quaint idea. Okay, well, how'd you really do it? And it turns out that they were actually right. And I want to share this with you. Some of you have probably seen this, but they did walk. five tons, three meters tall, about 18 people can do this, three ropes, one in the back, two on each side. Rapa Nui 
great music, you know, puts you right in the mood. That's how you walk a five-ton statue. <laughs> it's a small number of people. There are no trees involved. There's no rolling. There's no logs. Um, what it is is the statue is designed with uh, its center of gravity about a third of the way from the base. It has a forward lean, and it performs in the way that we describe the physics of our own walking a controlled fall forward with the center of gravity shifting from side to side. That's exactly what it's doing. And um, it's wonderful engineering by uh, Polynesians, and uh, it's a wonderful story and um, quite exciting. This is a, an illustration from National Geographic uh, of that, uh, uh, sort of reenacting that. Love that illustration. And then uh, we were on the cover of National Geographic in July 2012. Some of you have seen uh, the documentary uh, Nova National Geographic where we um, figure out how to walk the statue from uh, a mold. So thank you very much. Um, I'll end on that. I'm really happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Terry. I think that's a neat video. Uh, while we wait for the uh, questions to be uh, collected, let me start out with a question that I think you actually answered in your, in your talk, <clears throat> but it may still be in some people's minds, and this is how uh, did this uh, settlement of the far-flung islands really happen? Could it be accounted for by accidental drift being just blown that way, or had it to be uh, deliberate uh, exploration that is uh, setting out with the with with goal of discovering new land? Had to be, absolutely had to be deliberate, um, mm -hmm. planned. Um, these are likely fleets of double-hulled canoes with 50 to 100 people in, in any one uh, event carrying uh, plants and animals, uh, animals like the rat either being brought intentionally or accidentally. Um, the consequences would be the same, and uh, the consequences would be such that there would be plenty of rats to eat in a very short amount of time. Now, don't get all excited because these are not dirty Norway rats. These are clean little <laughs> Pacific rats. They don't have diseases. And I'm sure they're quite good, you know, stuck on a skewer and barbecued. Um, so they, they, were, they would have been an important food source. And if you imagine a protein source that arrives with you and doesn't need any attention, and in about a year there can be, you can be on your way to having millions, um, you don't have to worry about protein. So yes, definitely intentional. And pe people are moving uh, west to east. They're moving against the prevailing trade winds and uh, they're in the process of discovering islands, probably with very high mobility, and then with Polynesian navigation, you can position fix those islands uh, in the relationship to the stars, and then it's easy to return to those islands. So you know where places are once you've discovered them. Uh, a question here is, is isolation the only factor in the uniqueness of the Rapa Nui language? Yes. Okay. Simple answer, and that's that's good. It's uh, it's it's. Uh, I will elaborate on. It. I, I I love yes and no. You know, yes, <laughs> no, um, <clears throat> gets people's attention. Um, it is. Uh, it does. It does uh, subgroup outside of the other. It is an East Polynesian language, clearly, but it is different than the Central East Polynesian languages, and it is probably one of the only places in East Polynesia that once colonized did remain isolated, if not relatively isolated, then completely isolated. And um, we have uh, other lines of evidence that suggest that it was a very difficult place to find or even relocate. 
And in celestial navigation, if you know where you're going and you make, for example, in the case of Rapa Nui, if you're settling, for, if, you're, if you're moving from the um, central eastern Pacific and you make about a one and a half or two degree error in where you think the island is, you will sail past it and not see any indications of land, indications like cloud forms, debris in the water, seabirds. You're out of the, range, the larger range of visibility, you sail past it, and the next thing is South America. So you could miss Rapa Nui pretty easily if you went out in that direction. It's really out there all by itself. Here's a question that uh, I think actually are a number of people around who may, who may have a similar sort of uh, uh, question in their minds. And this is if Polynesians came to South America, could they also have come to Santa Barbara or to at least to this coast uh, with a plank canoes, uh, a plank canoe technology passed onto the Chumash? It's absolutely positively feasible. Um, Polynesians got to South America. They hit every scrap of land in the Pacific, and there's no evidence they got to California. The reason being, I don't want to be too smug about that, the reason being is the chronology is completely wrong. Uh, there is no one in the remote Pacific Islands until uh, about 1200 AD, and the claims for the California contact are much earlier. Now, if the, if the, if the contact happened here later, that's, that's possible, but the chronology certainly doesn't fit uh, Polynesians reaching California when they haven't even left Samoa yet. So it's very unlikely that that's the case. Uh, Here's a question, uh, given the possibility of South American contact also, and this is, is there any evidence of genetic mixing between Easter Islanders, or other Polynesians for that matter, and South Americans? Uh, there's been some, some claims made. Um, there's some preliminary studies uh, that, there's some claims made for similarities between South Americans and Polynesians that are sort of hypothesized to be admixture. What we need to remember though is that there are Native American traits and Pacific Islander traits that are the same because they're both coming out of the same area a long time ago. So we get some similarity anyway. It depends on to what you are attributing those similarities, whether it's something recent or, some, or the shared ancestry that's much older. Um, so direct evidence for the, the context with South America, the very best thing is the sweet potato with its name. Uh, there have been claims for chicken and there's a whole uh, discussion about chicken and the the problems with that uh, evidence, both genetically and in terms of its chronology. Um, again, we I I think about Polynesians reaching South America in, in what have to be relatively small numbers because there's only so many people on canoes and there's a well-established South American population. So the impact that Polynesians could have could be small. The impact of Polynesians getting a crop like the sweet potato turns out to be very great because the sweet potato was, as it turns out, really well adapted to places like Hawaii and New Zealand where it became a really tremendously important crop. There are several questions that, uh, in one form or another, uh, refer to the issue of what happened this almost explosive movement of people out of central Polynesia at about the same time. Uh, well, what? What's, what's the cause for that? You know, it came up in the discussions yesterday um, about motivation, and I want a, a couple of observations about that. One, um, we often, for some reason, we're, we're very fond of uh, explanations that sort of think about something that pushes us. Um, and I heard some of that discussion yesterday, like something bad must have happened that someone wanted to go somewhere. Um, I, think, I think Gregor's talk today might have reminded us that, you know, animals and people are very adventurous and we're always kind of looking over the next hill or around the next uh, bend to see what there might be and what opportunities there might be. And along those lines, I really favor pull explanations with the idea that if you have a means to go there and you think there could be good things, why not go find it and be drawn by the absolute reward. Imagine if I said to you, I heard that there are islands in Tahiti that no one wants, and if you go there, you can, ho you can own it. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'll be running out the door right now um, on my way, because <laughs> there's, a great, there's, a, there's a great motivation in knowing that you might discover a place that is just full of endless resources that you and your descendants will own.
So I think the pull factors are very strong, and I think we tend to forget about those because we live in a very full world. Imagine a world with true uh, frontiers where you, know, you might discover, you were on the boat that discovered four humans, you know, the island of Tahiti. I would love to have been there, it would have been great. Um, one more question, as people set out on, on really far-flung voyages, as it were, even in large double outrigger canoes, and they provision themselves for a long voyage, but there's a limit as to f how far they can go. Do we know what the point, and this sort of point of return would have been? Very hard to say. We can look at it empirically and say that they reached uh, all of these islands in, in, at great distances, and it must have taken a, a quite a bit of time to reach some of them. What I find absolutely astonishing, and it tells us something about the pattern, is the Auckland Islands. I know the Pacific pretty well. I had to look where those, I had to look on a map when I heard about the, the results there, and I thought, where are those? Um, way down south of New Zealand, and it shows us that people must be sailing to the extremes and covering large areas and looking for every scrap of land and returning to the ones they want to. I don't, they didn't really return to the Auckland Islands, a pretty, pretty brutal place. But um, they would probably go well beyond the limits and then come back and fill in. Now, that might sound familiar because that's exactly what European uh, exploration did. Uh, the, the efforts were, let's go see what we can find. We'll, we'll be there for a couple of days. We'll stick a flag. We'll put it on the map. And we say we own it. And we'll come back later. And I think to some extent what we're seeing must have been something like that because you would, for example, on some voyage north, you would discover the Hawaiian Islands. Some people might stay, some people might keep moving and decide, well, let's go back the other way and look for something else. And then if it's known, and, and we know that Polynesians know, they had, a, they had a, a navigational map of the Pacific. So once you know where Hawaii is, it becomes part of your cultural knowledge. And then someone in the Marquesas or Tahiti can say, hey, I heard this place, there's this place north that's pretty nice, let's go. And so then it becomes, um, the mobility that people have then become what turns up in the oral traditions as multiple migrations. And in Hawaii, for example, you literally get, you know, 100 plus stories of people saying that so-and-so brought such and such from this island. And it probably reflects what was actually happening historically. And oral traditions cannot always be viewed as historical reality. There, there's quite a mix of, of reality and fantasy that we see in oral traditions. But in that regard, they're probably reflecting that, that high mobility and movement between the islands. Okay. Thank you very much, Terry, for a very enlightening talk. I, we have to move on. Thank you. <clears throat>